Thanks for listening to the sermon podcast from the Potter's House Church in Virginia Beach. Our vision is winning souls, making disciples, and planning churches. You're about to hear a message that was preached live from one of our recent church services. We hope that you'll open your heart to hear the Holy Spirit speaking directly through this message. Stay tuned after the message for information on how to get connected with us. Thanks again, and enjoy today's message. We're excited once again to gather together. Jeremiah, uh, we want to look tonight again at the book of Jeremiah, this time chapter 32. If you join me there, Jeremiah chapter 32, if you've got your Bible with you. I want to show you a video to begin tonight, and um, uh, this is a video that I looked up online, something that I had seen a few times, but uh, just to give you a, a little bit of an introduction of what you're about to see, uh, this, is a, this is a New Zealand warship that had been, uh, been doing some exploration in the South Sea, and uh, that is near the, uh, the continent of Antarctica. And so what we're about to see is uh, a, a huge storm that they encountered, and go ahead and hit play there if you would. Some of you squids might have your own stories like that uh, from large seas on the ocean which appear. Uh, and that's just one example, one that I found online, uh, of a massive storm. And what was interesting about that to me is that here you have some vast contrast. On one side of the glass is death and destruction. How many know to be outside of the boat means you're probably not going to last long. Is that correct? In a storm like that, in the sea that is so violent, uh, it would rip your body apart and then it would freeze you to death. Uh, But inside of that ship, on the other side of the glass, you have people recording with their phone. They're kind of giggling. They even have some music playing in the background. On one side of the glass, they're having a good time watching the storm. But if they were on the other side of the glass... That is certain death and destruction. And uh, if you think about it for a second tonight, that is a good picture of the Christian life. Inside of Christ, inside of our faith, we have peace and we have safety. But outside of Christ, we should be reminded tonight that our God, the Bible says that God is a consuming fire. And I want to preach a message tonight that I've titled, Not Afraid to Fear. I want to preach about the fear of God this evening because I believe this is something, this is a doctrine that has been lost or misunderstood greatly in, uh, in this generation. And I want to uh, remind us all tonight why it is important to maintain a healthy fear of the true and living God. Inside of Christ, oh, we've got it nice. But guess what? Outside Outside of his body, outside of faith in Jesus, our God is even worse than a storm of the southern sea. Let's read the scripture tonight, Jeremiah chapter 32, beginning with verse 38. This is an incredible promise that God makes to uh, the Old Testament saints, those who were longing for a day that they would have a new covenant of grace. They were under the bondage of being under the law Jeremiah makes a prediction here about a new covenant, a time when God would provide us a way to get a new heart. And I want you to pay close attention tonight. What is the purpose that God wants to put a new heart in his people? Are you ready for this? Jeremiah 32, verse 38. This is the promise that God's making to his people. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. I will give them one heart, and one way, that they may fear me forever for the good of them and their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant. Say everlasting. 
I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them good, but I will put my, my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. Verse 41, yes, I will rejoice over them to do them good, and I will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart, and with all my soul. Let's pray. Father, we come once again by the blood of Jesus. I'm grateful for the opportunity to gather in your house tonight. Lord, teach us once again, teach us to fear. Teach us, Lord, that you are a consuming fire and that, God, you saved us so that we could properly fear you. I'm praying tonight, restore a healthy respect and awe, a wonder, Lord, that you have saved us from your destructive power. I'm praying tonight, renew the fear of God in our hearts. We give you praise, all you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look tonight, not afraid to fear. And firstly, I want you to notice how much this doctrine has been lost. Uh, In the modern church world and in uh, many Christians today, there is no fear of God. We treat God many times like uh, a grandfather in the sky, just a a buddy, the old man upstairs. Uh, Jesus is my pal. Uh, He's my co-pilot. And... uh, and that is, a, that is a problem. This has caused many people to lose their fear, their respect for who God really is. Most of the time, it's because people are not in their word. They don't know some incredible stories that are in the Bible. And I just want to consider with you a few of these stories that when you start to think about them, ought to really make you tremble. Let's just consider a few of these stories that are included in your Bible and in mine. You remember the story of how God treated the Pharaoh? That when the people were in bondage and God said, it's time for them to go, he sends Moses and Aaron to represent the word of God before Pharaoh. Pharaoh was was resistant to the word of God. And when you read the story, it is very uh, stark. It's very uh, noticeable that God is pounding on Pharaoh again and again again. And again, God pounds him. Pharaoh hardens his heart toward God. And then the Bible says that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. And it's plague after plague, 10 of them to be exact. And the final one is the worst one, where it's the death of the firstborn. God kills Pharaoh's son because he's stubborn, because he won't listen, because he won't release the people of God. Ultimately, God kills Pharaoh and his armies by drowning them in the Red Sea. That's pretty harsh, isn't it? We usually tell the story from the perspective of of the Jewish people. You know, they're getting set free. God's delivering them. But let's not forget, God was pretty tough on Pharaoh. There's another story out in the wilderness place as the people were complaining to Moses and there arises a rebellion under a man named Korah. How many remember the story of Korah? He thinks he's got a better idea. He's going to lead the people in a better way than Moses. You know what God did with Korah? God opened up the earth underneath him, and the Bible says he was swallowed up, him and everyone who was following him. It's pretty serious. There was all of a sudden a a hole in the ground that opened and then closed, and guess what? No more Korah. God dealt with that problem. God did that. Moses couldn't do that. There's a story about the prophet Elisha. One day he's walking along, minding his own business. And the Bible says that there were 42 young boys who started mocking him. (laughs) Look at Elisha. He's bald. Started calling him names. You know what God did to those boys? He released two bears out of the forest and instructed them to kill those 42 boys. See, this is not uh, what we teach on Sunday school, is it? We don't hear these scriptures on Caleb verse of the day. And God released two she-bears to maul the 42 mockers. But God did that. That's in your Bible. We read a couple of weeks ago about Nabal. Nabal, the foolish husband of Abigail. The Bible says that when he, uh, when he resisted David and his men and uh, acted foolishly, that God struck Nabal and caused his heart to become a stone within him. God did that. God judge this man in his foolishness. 
You say, okay, pastor, well, those are all Old Testament stories. That's the God before he got saved. In the New Testament, we have a different God now. Is that true? God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But we have some interesting stories in the New Testament, too, that when you consider them, ought to cause you to tremble a little bit. In the early church, we have the book of Acts. In chapter 2, God sends the Holy Spirit, anoints His church, on the day of Pentecost, to go and win the world. It's exciting. It's fun. They preach the gospel. People getting saved on every hand. And you flip the page to Acts chapter 5. You almost wish that the chapter's not in there. But in Acts chapter 5, you have two people, a couple named Ananias and Sapphira. And they had promised to give a certain portion. They promised to, that they would sell some land and that they would bring the proceeds to the church. Now, that's a pretty nice thing that they did. Now, the Bible says that, that when they got to church to give what they had promised, that they held back a portion. It wasn't that they were stingy. It wasn't that they kept it all for themselves. They just held back a portion for themselves. The Bible says that, the, the, that Peter speaks to them on behalf of the Holy Spirit and says, Ananias... You did not lie to men, you lied to the Holy Spirit. And right there, God killed Ananias in the middle of the church service. God killed him. They dragged him out, dead, D-E-D, dead, no coming back. Five minutes later, here comes his wife, Sapphira, same conversation. Did you, did you keep back a portion? Yeah, you know, those, uh, God killed her too. God killed her. In church, New Testament, after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, God killed them. You read about Herod, who was struck down by God and consumed by worms. Also a book of Acts. And I just want you to, to consider, why are these stories in the Bible? Are they there to discourage you? Are they there to confuse us? I think that God includes these stories for one reason, to teach us to fear. That God is still a judge, even in the New Testament. Hello? You know, when we take, uh, when we take our offering, or we take our, our communion, right? And we read, uh, every time you're going to hear me read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where we, Paul gives us the instructions for how we conduct ourselves at the Lord's Supper, right? And you've heard me read it a hundred times, but what about this? where Paul says, if anyone eats the bread or drinks the cup unworthily, he is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of our Lord. That's why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat this bread or drink this cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. And that's why many of you are sick and weak, and some have even died. Is that something you should think about? Is there a reason why that's in the Bible? The doctrine of the fear of God has fallen on hard times. Now, you've heard preachers say, and you've probably even heard me say, that when it comes to the fear of God, don't take it the wrong way. We shouldn't be cowering in fear like a child with an abusive father. We know tonight God is not abusive. God is holy. God is righteous. God is good. However, that does not mean that we shouldn't fear Him. What is meant by fear, many would say, is really something more like respect. There are attempts in many sermons to water down or candy coat the fear of God. But I want to encourage you tonight. Yes, we have the Lamb of God who laid down His life. But we sang it tonight. We also have the Lion of Judah. And when the Lion of Judah returns, the Bible says He will come back riding on a white horse with a sword coming out of His mouth to consume the nations. In sin, he is the lion as well as the lamb. Let us never paint Jesus as just the pathetic best buddy who's begging to spend more time with you. Could you please just give me one more hour of your time? I'd like to hang out with you. That's how we often paint Jesus. But he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And part of that means we've got to remember who he really is. What, what is the result? What, what's, the, what's the problem with, with losing the fear of God? Well, we see it happening around us, don't we? I've mentioned a few times, but the United Methodist Church, so-called church, 
That was founded by uh, John and Charles Wesley, the Salvation Army. In the late 1800s, part of the Second Great Awakening, they had this great foundation, this great move of God. It was a revival of the times. Today, fast forward 140 years, the United Methodist Church has officially passed law, bylaws stating that, uh, that homosexuals can become ministers and supporting the LGBTQ plus lifestyle, not only supporting it, but preaching it from their pulpits. You know why that happens? No fear of God. No fear of judgment. What can happen to churches is that sin can be excused. Oh, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Everybody is a sinner. Grace is cheapened. If I'm allowed to do whatever I want, then God has to forgive me for whatever I do. It's greasy grace. And ultimately what happens tonight is that God is robbed of true worship. What we call worship is nothing more than praise. You know the the difference between praise and worship, right? Praise is nice. Praise is when we all gather together and we make noise. Jesus said that even uh, if if, uh, they didn't didn't praise God, that that the rocks would cry out in praise. And there are even entire Christian industries that cater to the idea of praise, Christian concerts, right? And Christian concerts are great. I don't mind supporting these artists, some of them making some incredible music. But the problem is you can go to a, a praise service, you can go to a Christian concert, you can lift your hands and make some noise, and you can walk out the other side being exactly the same as you walked in. You get a little uh, goosebumps and tinglies and get a little emotions running through your veins, but praise doesn't change people. True worship is how you live. True worship is the decisions you make when nobody's looking. And if you're going to make righteous decisions when nobody's looking, do you know how we can make those kinds of decisions? Fear of God. I'm afraid of what happens if I don't do right. If you have no fear of God, you're going to enter into all kinds of uh, uh, unholy and unrighteous actions in the secret place. This is the problem with the sinful heart. See, the hearts that, that we have, the default position of our hearts as we come into this world, we are marred by sin, we are under a curse. And the Bible says that our hearts are desperately wicked. That is so important for you to understand. It's important because we have to know what's in us. I preached on Wednesday night about the tension, about the war that is constantly happening in us, the war between the flesh and the spirit. Even when we're saved, even when we're right with God, even in the best of circumstances, you still have flesh. You still have evil desires. You have a part of you that does not want to serve God. Is that true? How are we going to win this battle? I spoke about it Wednesday night. You've got to feed the spirit, not the flesh. But I want to share with you tonight even more than that. If we're going to, uh, if we're going to avoid sin, if we're going to win the battle between flesh and spirit, we've got to have a new heart which is made to fear God. 1 Timothy verse 4 Paul is predicting what will happen in the last days, which I believe we are living. He says the Spirit says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having, listen, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And so because God is good, because God is faithful, Even in our sinful conditions, God has created us with a conscience. A conscience. Your conscience agrees with God. Your conscience is the laws of God written on the heart of every man so that when you do right, you feel right. And when you do wrong, you feel wrong. Isn't that true? When you know that you're sinning, you get a sense of guilt and condemnation and shame. What have I done? Where did that come from? Even before you were saved, we have a a, a sense of that. And that is the conscience. The word conscience means with knowledge. Con, science. With knowledge. That each of us, even in our sinful condition, we have a certain knowledge of what's right and wrong. That's why, by the way, that even those who've never heard of Christ, even those who've never read the Bible, will still be accountable to God when they stand before Him. 
because God even gave them a limited amount of knowledge inside of their heart, conscience. And when people respond to their conscience, maybe uh, God will be able to respond to them. But every one of us, we know what it's like to violate our conscience, right? And this scripture tells us that when we resist the Spirit of God and when we do what we know is wrong, it is possible to have our conscience seared with a hot iron. How about that for an image? What happens when you sear something? Right, I'm thinking about a nice juicy prime rib. And you heat up that grill to as hot as it can get. And when you put the meat on there, you're going to give it a good sear on both sides. So it stays juicy in the middle. That's the right way to, to do a steak. But that's possible to do with your conscience. When we do what we know is wrong, it's like taking a hot iron and searing those emotions, those feelings, those convictions from God to the point where we don't feel it anymore. Isn't it true that the first time you commit a certain sin, man, you really feel bad. But the second one, the second time you do it, a little less conviction. And the third time, and the fourth time, and the 20th time, and the 50th time. And by the time you're down the road doing what you know is wrong, but now you can't feel it anymore because you've seared the conscience. That's why we need a new heart. A seared conscience is unaware of God's judgment, God's wrath, and has no fear of what comes next. The Old Covenant attempted to deal with this problem through a series of sacrifices, through a series of, uh, of laws written on tablets. And we see the struggle of the Jewish people who are striving and contending with this reality. The problem with that system, of course, is that the laws of God were written on tablets, the laws of God were written on scrolls, but the laws of God were never written on their hearts. And so the, the, the law was external and became a hammer. The law, as Paul teaches in Romans, the law was good because it revealed our need for a Savior. But listen to how God was instructing His people. Deuteronomy 10, verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, to love Him, to serve the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul. You thought Jesus came up with that one. No, that was God speaking to Moses. Verse 20, Deuteronomy 10, You shall fear, say fear. Fear, fear the Lord your God, and you shall serve Him. To Him you shall hold fast and take oaths in His name. Isaiah eight thirteen, The Lord of hosts, Him you shall hallow, Him will be your fear, and let Him be your dread. God instructed His people, you know, what would be good for you is if you would have some fear, fear of God, fear of His judgment, fear of doing wrong. It will keep you. How many love the book of Proverbs? Every new believer here, I would recommend read a chapter of Proverbs every day. There's 31 chapters in Proverbs. It's a great way to start learning the wisdom of God. But I want to tell you something about Proverbs. You're not going to get it unless first you have a healthy fear of God. On the very first page of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning. If you try to get deep into Proverbs, if you try to apply those things to your life and have no fear of God, it's going to be a waste of time. Jesus even spoke about the fear of God. Matthew 10, 28. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear Him, God, fear Him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. The Bible has a lot to say about fearing God. And despite the best efforts of the Old Testament believers, the problem was that the, 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 the laws of God were written on scrolls, they were written on tablets, but they were not written in their hearts. God, uh, God put this system of sacrifices in place and hoping that somehow that watching these innocent animals die on a daily basis, like, what did they do? Bring in the oxen, the sheep, the goats, the pigeons, the doves, and the priests every day with a knife slitting their throats and letting the blood flow on a daily basis, 
hoping that somebody would understand that sin leads to death. That we shouldn't commit these things because it leads to the death of innocent life. But that sacrificial system was temporary and pointing toward, ultimately, a future perfect sacrifice. What this sacrificial system could not do is provide a new heart. And that's what we see in our scripture tonight. We see how God predicts that He's going to provide a path to replace our sinful hearts. That was a good place to say amen. Verse 39 of our scripture says, I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever. This is not a temporary thing that God wants you to feel for just a moment or just during the first few weeks or first months of your salvation. No, even in our older age, even as we, uh, as we, uh, as we age in the kingdom of God, even as we get better with time, like fine wine, hopefully, that not only uh, are we go- growing in grace and in knowledge, but we are also growing in the fear of God. Jeremiah says this new heart that God is going to put into us is going to help us to fear Him forever for the good of them and their children after them. This new heart that God will give to His people He is predicting that this new heart, that the difference between the old heart and the new heart is this. The new heart will be able to fear God properly forever. It's going to retune our attitude. It's going to uh, reconcile our ability. It's not going to allow us to be seared in our conscience to throw away the the respect for God, it's going to cause us to fear God. It doesn't have an expiration date. You know, in heaven, we will still have a healthy fear of God. In fact, when we are able to see God, when we are able to see Christ face to face, we think we're, 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 sometimes we think we're just going to treat Him like buddy-buddy, somebody to go fishing with. But Jesus is fearful, isn't He? Think about those disciples. I mentioned the story this morning when they're out on the the Sea of Galilee and they're in the middle of a storm and that storm is thrashing their boat around and they're in trouble, they're fearful of their life. Jesus is taking a little nap. I like the t-shirt that says, Jesus takes naps. And when they woke him up saying, Lord, don't you care about us? Have you no concern for us? And he rebukes them for their lack of faith. The Bible says, he says, peace, peace. And in one moment, the storm ends, the waves stop, the winds cease. And the Bible says that the disciples looked at Jesus and they feared him. Why? Why was that their reaction? Whoa. Because they understood in that moment that the power that Jesus had was greater than the power of that storm that they thought was going to kill them. They thought they were about to die. And Jesus said one word and they realized This dude has some power. This new covenant fear that Jeremiah speaks about tonight, there's a reason why God wants us to fear him. There's a reason why. And what I want to call it tonight, I don't know if this is uh, theologically sound, but I'm going to use it anyway. The new covenant fear is equivalent to super glue of faith. The reason why God needs us to fear is because it binds us to Him, to His will. It connects us to Him in a supernatural way. Now, let's, let's, let's remember, we hear sermons, and I preach on a regular basis about the kindness of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, the forgiveness of God. We love those things about Him. He's, his patience, His long-suffering, all that God gives us. I spoke this morning how God gives us. He speaks a second time to us when we don't deserve it. Thank God for all those things. But in the midst of all of those truths, we cannot lose the fact that He is fearful. He is the lamb, and He's also the lion. Have you seen the video of the guy who found himself face-to-face with a lion in the cage? I don't know where it was from. I saw some video online. But he works in the zoo, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, something happened. A gate opened, and there he was, face 
to face with a deadly cat. And you know, if you work with an animal like that every day, throwing food, uh, administering uh, uh, medicine, and you know, taking care of that animal, uh, sometimes it's easy uh, to lose that healthy respect that this thing can kill you. And when all of a sudden he was face to face with a wild animal, he remembered, I got to get out of here. You know, sometimes as we traffic in the things of God, we have three services a week. We have prayer meetings. We have events. We do all kinds of things for God. Let us never forget that this is the same God that one day is going to rain down fire, that the heavens will melt away with his judgment. Let's not forget that, church. But let's also not forget the heart of the one that we fear. There is often a reason why we recoil from the doctrine of fear of God, why we seem like uh, many Christians don't want to contemplate fearing God. And it's, as mentioned, sometimes we have flashbacks to childhood phobias or abusive situations. But I want to challenge you tonight because the fear of God is different from the faithless fear of man. The fear of man comes because of abuse, comes from broken situations. But it is healthy to fear God because God is not abusive. God is not unrighteous. Listen to what Jeremiah goes on to say, verse 40. I will make an everlasting covenant with them, and I will not turn away from doing them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. Let me ask you tonight, is there any part of you that wishes you could depart from the grace and mercy of God? I hope not. What is the super that keeps you connected to the will of God? The thing that Jeremiah says here, it's the fear. It's the fear of God. It is meant to be super glue that keeps us bonded in His everlasting promises. The God that we serve is still dangerous. But to us who are saved, the danger is passed off, passed away. We are like, we're like the, the captain and the, the crew of this ship that we saw. We're like them. We're on the inside thanking God that we're not out there. But that doesn't mean we can grow weary. That doesn't mean we can grow used to the fact. Have you grown used to the fact that God saved you from certain doom? Yes, thank God you are His sheep now. You are under the shepherd's love. God is going to help us. But never forget, He is not domesticated. He is not tame. He is still the judge of the nations. And tonight... It would do you well to bind you to His will for your life to have a healthy fear. I can't turn from God. I can't turn from His will. I'm afraid of what comes next if I do. I'm afraid what will happen if I think that thought or if I spend time with that person. I'm afraid because I don't want to turn from the, the Lord. I don't want to turn from His promises. I don't want to lose the miracle that God has produced in my life. Can I challenge you tonight to remember in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, that famous story from C.S. Lewis, the, the children find themselves in Narnia. I don't know, anybody seen this story or have read it? And there they are wandering around in the, after falling into Narnia in this, uh, this wild land. And the Christ figure in that story is, of course, Aslan the Lion. And they haven't met him. They don't, uh, they, they, they're not a, a aware of him yet. The children, they find themselves with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. And they have a conversation. They're talking about Aslan. They've heard the name. And they're asking Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, what is Aslan like? And they said, uh, well, he's a lion. And little Lucy Pevinson asks, well, lions are scary. Yes, lions are scary. They can bite your head off if they want to. And so little Lucy asks Mrs. Beaver, is he safe? Is he safe? She said, well, he is a lion. He's not tame, but he is good. What a beautiful way of describing the power and the glory of God. That we who have experienced his love and salvation, we can approach him without fear. We can approach him. We can go boldly into the throne room of God. And proclaim our needs before Him. This is not meant to separate you from God. This is meant to remind you that outside of Christ, we're on the outside of that boat. We've got nothing. 
But inside of Christ, our fear ought to, ought to bind us together to His will and purpose. Let's bow our heads for just a few moments. We want to pray together as we close. Not afraid to fear. You've heard, no doubt, you've heard in this generation a hundred sermons about the kindness of God. You've heard a hundred sermons about the grace, the mercy, the love of God. But ask yourself, have I ever considered the fear of God? Is there a reason we should be afraid? We shouldn't tremble at the character of God. We shouldn't be afraid of Him the way that an abused child is manipulated by fear from an abusive relationship. It's not that. We should be afraid of what comes next if we disobey. We should be afraid if we turn from God in any point of our lives. The fear of God is what keeps us. The new heart that God gives to us, the new life that is in Christ, this born-again life, God gives us a heart that includes a healthy fear of who He is. I don't want to turn because I don't want to face a judge. Tonight, if you're here this evening and you be honest for just a moment, maybe you've lost the fear of God. And the evidence is that you're not afraid to sin. The evidence that you've lost fear of God is that you enter into what you know is evil behavior, evil speech, evil thoughts with no second thought. Your conscience has become seared to the point that you sin without even thinking about it. Have you lost the fear of God tonight? Maybe God would give you His grace by reawakening that fear. What comes next? You know, nobody spoke about hell more than Jesus. Jesus revealed what hell was like. He revealed what would happen to people who turned from Him in a lake of fire, torment. The rich man in Lazarus, that, that man, when he found himself in the, in the flames of hell, he cried out to Lazarus and said, Oh, Lazarus, go tell my brothers about this place. I don't want them to come here. Oh, Lazarus, I wish I would have listened to you. Jesus told that story. And tonight, maybe God is pricking your heart. Maybe God is awakening in you a healthy fear. What happens if I don't get my heart right tonight? What happens if I continue on this path? Maybe God would resurrect in you a new heart made to fear God. And you want to recognize that tonight. Say, Lord, I don't want to face you as judge. I want to know you as Savior. Before you leave this place, you can be transformed. You can be changed. Before you leave this place, would you respond to God's mercy, God's grace? He is good. And He has given us an opportunity to know Him through His Son, Jesus. God poured out His wrath on Christ on the cross so that you wouldn't have to face Him. Jesus died for everyone, but not everyone is saved because not everyone receives the gift of glorious salvation and eternal life through Christ. If that's you tonight, you need that. Don't leave this place without knowing Christ as your Savior. If you don't know Him as Savior, you will know Him as judge. It's one or the other. If you're ready tonight, say, Lord... Lord, I'm ready. I, I, I've, this world's got nothing for me. I want to surrender tonight. If that's you, can I see your hand? You lift it up. You lift up your hand right now. Say, remember me in prayer tonight. If that's you, can I pray with you? Someone here, not right with God. Or backslidden in your heart. You be honest for a moment. You say, man, I find myself doing things, saying things, thinking things that, that I'd be ashamed if people knew about it. Oh, but God knows about it. And tonight, if you want to get your heart right, this is your opportunity. I need to repent, need to turn from sin, need to trust in the Lord for salvation. Is that you? Quickly, lift up your hand. Somebody here, God's speaking to you. Is there someone here? Quickly tonight. Don't miss this opportunity. Thank God. I want to speak to the church then. Listen, brothers and sisters, we thank God. We thank God that God gave us Jesus, our Savior. But let's never, never forget that He is the Lion of Judah, and that He is worthy of our fear. We ought to tremble at His words. We shouldn't uh, read the Bible, and especially we shouldn't read the words of Jesus and say to ourselves, eh, maybe I'll do that. To think that we could override the will of God, that means you have no fear of Him? To read the Scriptures and to have them confront your life and to think, ah, I've got a better way. Do you have no fear tonight of who He is? 
what he's capable of. See, the fear of God is meant tonight to bind us together into his will and his purpose. I challenge you tonight, we're going to pray at this altar, say, Lord, restore my fear of God before I leave this place. Come on, church, let's uh, stand up to our feet. We're going to open up this altar for, for prayer. Oh, God, that you would renew a healthy fear of your word and your truth tonight. We're going to open up this altar for prayer. Oh, God, that you would speak to us, that you would help us, that you would move in this place in the name of Jesus. We need to teach our children the fear of the Lord, not the fear of us, fear of the Lord. We need to teach our disciples, our new believers, we need to teach them the fear of the Lord. Amen. Right where you are, you can continue to pray if you need to. But I want to I read a, a portion of Scripture tonight as we close from Hebrews chapter 12. Now remember, this is New Testament, New Testament doctrine. This is under the, the new covenant of grace. I want you to listen carefully to what the author of Hebrews shares with, a, with the church. He says, be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. If the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger, we will certainly not escape if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. Do you hear what he's saying there? He's saying the people in the Old Covenant, the people of the Old Testament, the people of Israel, they had Moses, but they refused to listen to Moses. The author of Hebrews says, we have somebody better than Moses. We have the Son of God himself who came down from heaven. Let us not reject his words. He goes on, when God spoke from Sinai, his voice shook the earth. But now he makes another promise. He says, once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping Him with fear and with awe. The King James says, with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. That's New Testament. He is a consuming fire in the Old Testament. He's the same God who consumed the prophets of Baal on top of Mount Carmel. He's a consuming fire in the New Testament too. Through Christ, we can have a bubble of God's peace. But outside of that bubble is death, destruction. Let's never forget that. Let's never forget that. Let's lift up our hands tonight. We're going to pray together. <clears throat> now let's, say, let's say this prayer together with one voice. Say, God in heaven, forgive me. Forgive me tonight. I've, I've, grown, uh, I've, I've grown too close sometimes, too familiar with your grace and mercy so that I've lost a healthy fear, reverence and awe for your power. Tonight, remind me that you are a consuming fire. Renew the fear of God in me, the fear of committing sin, the fear of, of, of judgment, so, God, I want to serve you. I want to stay close to you. Let the fear of God be the super glue that keeps me close from straying, from wandering, from growing distant. Lord, I don't even want to get close to the ways of the world, to the person I used to be, to the certain judgment upon sin. I want to stay far away from that, and I want to stay close to you. The way I stay close is to fear, and I thank you tonight that you've made a way for me to remain close through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. I pledge my life, all that I am and all that I can be is in your hands tonight. Help me to serve, to love and to fear the Most High God. We give you praise tonight in Jesus' mighty name. In, here in America, there was a powerful preacher named Jonathan Edwards, and his most famous sermon that he preached was called Sinners in the Hands of a Holy God. 
And you can read that sermon. You can find it. Google it. I dare you. I double dog dare you. They say that when he preached this sermon to the church that he was an old man. He was already in his uh, later 70s or 80s. He, uh, his vision began to fail him. And he had written out this sermon longhand on a piece of paper that he was reading from the pulpit. And he, because his vision was so poor that he was close up to the paper trying to read it, reading what he had written, sinners in the hands of an angry God. And as he was there preaching this message, he couldn't see it, but the Spirit of God began to be poured out upon that congregation. People were having visions of the floor collapsing underneath them. They were seeing visions of impending doom because of sin. He said, he made statements in that sermon that the only thing that separates you from an eternal hellfire is a spider web of God's mercy. And if it breaks. And people in that sermon, they began to have the healthy fear of God and they began to grasp on to whatever they could, holding on to pillars as if they were falling into hell at that moment. You say, well, that sounds pretty terrible. That doesn't sound like a healthy Sunday morning service. But you know what was born? Revival. From that place, people went out and began to tell everyone, serve Jesus. People got saved. There was so much revival in those days that even the bars began closing. It was what led to, ultimately, the Emancipation Proclamation. That there was, there, was a, there was a change in the land, in the politics, because people could not avoid the will of God. I challenge you, listen, the church has enough of God's grace. The, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the kindness of God has been over-preached, and the fear of God has been ignored. There is a balance. We can't preach one without the other. And tonight I want to challenge you, this week, would you reflect on the fear of God? Would you reflect on that? Would you find, do your own study. Don't believe me, you do your own study. You're going to find out there's a lot more of the fear of God than you might think in the Word of God. Amen. We're going to close in prayer tonight, asking God's blessing to go with us. Thank you for listening to this message from the Potter's House Church in Virginia Beach. If you sense the Holy Spirit drawing you out of your sins and into a new life with Him, pray this prayer from your heart today. God in heaven, I know I've sinned against you. I've hurt people, I've hurt myself, and I've broken your laws. Today, I turn from my sins as I surrender to your perfect will. I believe Jesus Christ is your Son and that He died and rose again for me. I receive Him today as my Lord and Savior. May the old things of my past pass away as you make me a new creation. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit to give me strength to live for you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. We want to help you live for God. Please join us in person for one of our upcoming church services. We are located in the heart of Virginia Beach at 1045 Lynn Haven Parkway, about one mile from the Lynn Haven Mall. Please check the show notes for links to our website and social media. You can also find a link to support this ministry with a generous donation. We would be so grateful. We look forward to sharing future messages here on the VBPH Sermon Podcast. In the meantime, we pray that God would strengthen you to serve Him with all your heart.